The Moon Metal. Chapter 13. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betsy Bush, in Marquette, Michigan, June 2007. The Moon Metal, by Garrett P. Service. Chapter 13. The Looting of the Moon. I shall spare the reader a recital of the tireless efforts, continuing through many almost sleepless weeks, whereby Andrew Hall obtained his clue to Dr. Six's method. It was manifest from the beginning that the agent concerned must be some form of etheric, or so-called electric energy. But how to set it in operation was the problem. Finally he hit upon the apparatus for his initial experiments, which I have already described. Recurring to what had been done more than half a century ago by Hertz, when he concentrated electric waves upon a focal point by means of a concave mirror, said Hall, I saw that the key I wanted lay in an extension of these experiments. At last I found that I could transform the energy of an engine into undulations of the ether, which, when they had been concentrated upon a metallic object, like a chunk of gold, imparted to it an intense charge of an apparently electric nature. Upon this charging a metallic body enclosed in a vacuum, I observed that the energy imparted to it possessed the remarkable power of disrupting its atoms and projecting them off in straight lines, very much as occurs with a cathode in a crook's tube. But, this was of supreme importance, I found that the line of projection was directly towards the apparatus from which the impulse producing the charge had come. In other words, I could produce two poles between which a marvelous interaction occurred. My transformer, with its concentrating mirror, acted as one pole from which energy was transferred to the other pole, and that other pole immediately flung off atoms of its own substance in the direction of the transformer. But these atoms were stopped by the glass wall of the vacuum tube and when I tried the experiment with the metal removed from the vacuum and surrounded with air, it failed utterly. This at first completely discouraged me, until I suddenly remembered that the moon is in a vacuum, the great vacuum of interplanetary space, and that it possesses no perceptible atmosphere of its own. At this a great light broke around me, and I shouted, Eureka! Without hesitation I constructed a transformer of great power, furnished with a large parabolic mirror to transmit the waves in parallel lines, erected the machinery and building here, and when all was ready for the final experiment, I telegraphed for you. Prepared by these explanations, I was all on fire to see the thing tried. Hall was no less eager, and calling in his two faithful assistants to make the final adjustments, he led the way into what he facetiously named the Lunar Chamber. If we fail, he remarked with a smile that had an element of worriment in it, it will become the lunatic chamber. But no danger of that. You observe this polished silver knob, supported by a metallic rod curved over at the top like a crane. That constitutes the pole from which I propose to transmit the energy to the moon, and upon which I expect the storm of atoms to be centered by reflection from the mirror at which focus it is placed. One moment, I said. Am I to understand that you think that the moon is a solid mass of artemisium, and that no matter where your radiant force strikes it, a cathode pole will be formed there from which atoms will be projected to the earth? No, said Hall. I must carefully choose the point on the lunar surface where to operate. But that will present no difficulty. I made up my mind, as soon as I had penetrated Six's secret, that he obtained the metal from those mystic white streaks which radiate from Tycho, and which have puzzled the astronomers ever since the invention of telescopes. I now believe those streaks to be composed of immense veins of the metal that Six has most appropriately named Artemisium, which you, of course, recognize as being derived from the name of the Greek goddess of the moon, Artemis, whom the Romans called Diana. But now to work. It was less than a day past the time of new moon, and the Earth's satellite was too near the sun to be visible in broad daylight. 
Accordingly, the mirror had to be directed by means of knowledge of the moon's place in the sky. Driven by accurate clockwork, it could be depended upon to retain the proper distance when once set. With breathless interest, I watched the proceedings of my friend and his assistants. The strain upon the nerves of all of us was such as could not have been borne for many hours at a stretch. When everything had been adjusted to his satisfaction, Hall stepped back, not without betraying his excitement in flushed cheeks and flashing eyes, and pressed a lever. The powerful engine underneath the floor instantly responded. The experiment was begun. I have set it upon a point about a hundred miles north of Tycho, where the Yerkes photographs show a great abundance of the white substance, said Hall. Then we waited. A minute elapsed. A bird, fluttering in the opening above for a second or two, wrenched our strained nerves. Hall's face turned pale. "'They had better keep away from here,' he whispered with a ghastly smile. Two minutes. I could hear the beating of my heart. The engine shook the floor. Three minutes. Hall's face was wet with perspiration. The bird blundered in and startled us again. Four minutes. We were like statues, with all eyes fixed on the polished ball of silver, which shone in the brilliant light concentrated upon it by the mirror. Five minutes. The shining ball had become a confused blue, and I violently winked to clear my vision. At last! Thank God! Look! There it is! It was Hall who spoke, trembling like an aspen. The silver knob had changed color. What seemed a miniature rainbow surrounded it, with concentric circles of blinding brilliance. Then something dropped, flashing, upon an earthen dish set beneath the ball. Another glittering drop followed, and at a shorter interval another. Almost before a word could be uttered, the drops had coalesced and became a tiny stream, which, as it fell, twisted itself into a bright spiral, gleaming with a hundred shifting hues, and forming on the bottom of the dish a glowing interlacing maze of viscid rings and circlets, which turned and twined about and over one another, until they had blended and settled into a button-shaped mass of hot metallic jelly. Hall snatched the dish away and placed another in its stead. "'This will be about right for a watch-charm when it cools,' he said, with a return of his customary self-command. "'I promised you the first specimen. I'll catch another for myself.' "'But can it be possible that we are not dreaming?' I exclaimed. "'Do you really believe that this comes from the moon?' "'Just as surely as rain comes from the clouds,' cried Hall, with all his old impatience. Haven't I just showed you the whole process? Then I congratulate you. You will be as rich as Dr. Six. Perhaps, was the unperturbed reply, but not until I have enlarged my apparatus. At present I shall hardly do more than supply mementos to my friends. But since the principle is established, the rest is mere detail." Six weeks later, the financial centers of the earth were shaken by the news that a new supply of artemisium was being marketed from a mill which had been secretly opened in the Sierras of California. For a time there was almost a panic. If Hall had chosen to do so, he might have precipitated serious trouble. But he immediately entered into negotiations with government representatives, and the inevitable result was that, to preserve the monetary system of the world from upheaval, Dr. Six had to consent that Hall's mill should share equally with his in the production of artemisium. During the negotiations, the doctor paid a visit to Hall's establishment. The meeting between them was most dramatic. Six tried to blast his rival with a glance, but knowledge is power, and my friend faced his mysterious antagonist, whose deepest secrets he had penetrated, with an unflinching eye. It was remarked that Dr. Six became a changed man from that moment. His masterful air seemed to have deserted him, and it was with something resembling humility that he assented to the arrangement which required him to share his enormous gains with his conqueror. Of course, Hall's success led to an immediate recrudescence of the efforts to extract artemisium from the six-ore, and equally, of course, 
every such attempt failed. Hall, while keeping his own secret, did all he could to discourage the experiments, but they naturally believed that he must have made the very discovery which was the subject of their dreams, and he could not, without betraying himself and upsetting the finances of the planet, directly undeceive them. The consequence was that fortunes were wasted in hopeless experimentation, and with Hall's achievement dazzling their eyes, the deluded fortune-seekers kept on in the face of endless disappointments and disaster. And presently there came another tragedy. The six-mill was blown up. The accident, although many people refused to regard it as an accident, and asserted that the doctor himself, in his chagrin, had applied the match, the explosion, then, occurred about sundown, and its effects were awful. The great works, with everything pertaining to them, and every rail that they contained, were blown to atoms. They disappeared as if they had never existed. Even the twin tunnels were involved in the ruin, a vast cavity being left in the mountainside where Six's ten acres had been. The force of the explosion was so great that the shattered rock was reduced to dust. To this fact was owing the escape of the troops camped near. While the mountain was shaken to its core, the enormous parapets of living rock were hurled down the precipices of the Teton. No missiles of appreciable size traversed the air, and not a man in the camp was injured. But Jackson's hole, filled with red dust, looked for days afterwards like the mouth of a tremendous volcano just after an eruption. Dr. Six had been seen entering the mill a few minutes before the catastrophe by a sentinel who was stationed about a quarter of a mile away, and who, although he had felled like an ox by the shock, and had his eyes, ears, and nostrils filled with flying dust, miraculously escaped with his life. After this a new arrangement was made whereby Andrew Hall became the sole producer of artemisium, and his wealth began to mount by leaps of millions towards the starry heights of the billions. About a year after the explosion of the six mill, a strange rumor got about. It came first from Budapest in Hungary, where it was averred several persons of credibility had seen Dr. Max Six. Millions had been familiar with his face and his personal peculiarities through actually meeting him, as well as through photographs and descriptions, and unless there was an intention to deceive, it did not seem possible that a mistake could be made in identification. There surely never was another man who looked just like Dr. Six. And besides, was it not demonstrable that he must have perished in the awful destruction of his mill? Soon after came a report that Dr. Six had been seen again, this time at a cateringburg in the Urals. Next he was said to have paid a visit to Batang, in the mountainous district of southwestern China, and finally, according to rumor, he was seen in Sicily, at Nicolosi, among the volcanic pimples on the southern slope of Mount Etna. Next followed something of more curious and more startling interest. A chemist at Budapest, where the first rumors of Six's reappearance had placed the mysterious doctor, announced that he could produce artemisium and proved it, although he kept his process secret. Hardly had the sensation caused by this news partially subsided when a similar report arrived from a cateringburg, another from Batang, after that a fourth from Nicolosi. Nobody could fail to notice the coincidence. Wherever the doctor, or was it his ghost, appeared, there shortly afterwards somebody discovered the much-sought secret. After this, Six's apparitions rapidly increased in frequency, followed in each instance by the announcement of another productive artemisium mill. He appeared in Germany, Italy, France, England, and finally at many places in the United States. "'It is the old doctor's revenge,' said Hall to me one day, trying to smile, although the matter was too serious to be taken humorously. Yes, it is his revenge, and I must admit that it is complete. The price of artemisium has fallen one half within six months. All the efforts we have made to hold back the flood have proved useless. The secret itself is becoming public property. We shall inevitably be overwhelmed with artemisium, just as we were with gold, and the last condition of the financial world will be worse than the first.' 
my friend's gloomy prognostications came near being fulfilled to the letter. Ten thousand artemisium mills shot their etheric rays upon the moon, and our unfortunate satellite's metal ribs were stripped by atomic force. Some of the great white rays that had been one of the telescopic wonders of the lunar landscapes disappeared, and the face of the moon, which had remained unchanged before the eyes of the children of Adam from the beginning of their race, now looked as if the blast of a furnace had swept it. At night, on the moonward side, the earth was studded with brilliant spikes, all pointed at the heart of its child in the sky. But the looting of the moon brought disaster to the robber planet. So mad were the efforts to get the precious metal that the surface of our globe was fairly showered with it. Productive fields were, in some cases, almost smothered under a metallic coating. The air was filled with shining dust, until finally famine and pestilence joined hands with financial disaster to punish the grasping world. Then at last the various governments took effective measures to protect themselves and their people. Another combined effort resulted in an international agreement whereby the production of the precious moon metal was once more rigidly controlled. But the existence of a monopoly, such as Dr. Six had so long enjoyed, and in the enjoyment of which Andrew Hall had for a brief period succeeded him, was henceforth rendered impossible. End of chapter 13 This recording is in the public domain.